something I learned reading like uh, Ian Banks and M. John Harrison was that you can just have some fun as well as telling a serious story. You can, there's nothing to stop you just putting in all the stuff that interests you as well. And just, uh, you know, and when I say having fun, I don't mean just like a comedy, but I just mean you can, if you want big spaceships with super lasers and whatever, you can have them and you can just go to town. Hello and welcome to this special author Q&A for Fanfy Addict. I'm Fraser Armitage, sci-fi writer and reviewer for fanfyaddict.com. And today joining me is the absolute king of space opera. He is a, the brightest star in sci-fi right now. It's Gareth L. Powell. Hi, Gareth. How are you doing Hi. today? Yeah, good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, your latest book is Descendant Machine, which I absolutely loved. Um, could you just start out by maybe telling us a little bit about Descendant Machine? Uh, well, uh, Descendant Machine is a standalone story set in the same universe as last year's novel stars and bones but it's slightly less horror tinged than that one this is more of a kind of sci-fi mystery novel where we're trying to work out what's inside the mysterious alien artifact um and so it's a bit like the maltese vulcan you have various different groups trying to grab hold of the secret and find out what's inside it Excellent. That's a really good way of summing it up. There's so much going on in this book that is a little bit hard to know where to start with regard to there's so many things I want to ask you about it. And um, but first of all, it's it's told kind of like a multi POV book, but also it's told completely from the perspective of a spaceship at the same time. <laughs> so um how do you approach that? Do you know when you start a book like this that it's gonna be told with different perspectives in mind, or is that something that comes to you as you write the story? Um, sometimes I usually start off with one main character and then realize that I'm going to have to use different, um, viewpoints to get different, um, perspectives because the, uh, the viewpoint character obviously can't be everywhere at once. So, um, I, I started off, um, with, uh, Nicola Mafalda, the, uh, the sort of the main human character, and then realized that I would need um, another character placed on the machine to see it opening while she's off running around the, the galaxy so we could get that kind of tension. And then I just got the bright idea to structure it all as a, a report into something that had gone disastrously wrong um, and, and, and set it out from that point of view, which just, you know, just for fun, but also f for the reader to go up okay, this is all going to go disastrously wrong. Let's find out how. So, yeah. That's awesome. Mafalda, Nicola Mafalda is such a cool character. I absolutely loved her. What What was the inspiration for her? Was, was she drawn from anything specific? No, she. Um, I mean, most of my characters just kind of materialise out of my brain. They're not consciously based on, on real or other fictional people at all. They're, they're kind of like... I'll take kind of like one small part of me and then turn that up to 11. Um, you know, so they're, they're, they're nothing like me, but I'll take, you know, I'll draw them from bits of characteristics and then just completely exaggerate them. As a, there were, speaking of bits of you thrown in there, um, there, I remember when I read the line about, you know, these space cat people, that you have in there. And I remember thinking, wow, Gareth must really like cats, you know? <laughs> Is it nice to be able to just, when you're writing sci-fi, to just really let go and to dial things up to 11 and to just have the freedom to just whether nothing's off the table? Absolutely. It's um, something I learned reading like uh, Ian Banks and M. John Harrison was that you can just have some fun as well as telling a serious story you can there's nothing to stop you just putting in all the stuff that interests you as well and just uh you know and when i say having fun i don't mean just like a comedy but i just mean you can if you want big spaceships with super lasers and whatever you can have them and you can just go to town yeah and in terms of character the spaceship is very much a big character in this story 
where do you start with trying to find the voice for a spaceship? Um, well, this one was um, fairly pompous, I think. I kind of, I was kind of thinking um, along the lines, funnily enough, as I mentioned, um, the Maltese Vulcan. Um, but uh, is it Sidney Greenstreet, the actor, who's in that, and he's in Casablanca as well? He kind of, this sort of large guy with this sort of imposing voice and presence, um, and very, but very avuncular at the same time. And I kind of, I guess I, I sort of had him in mind a little bit, but uh, as I say, part of him is uh, is me as well. So it's it's kind of a, a mishmash of those two. Yeah, that's really cool. When it comes to that mishmash, and one of the things that's really great that I loved about this book is the the mishmash of tones, but it all kind of belongs together. So you have some very deep and philosophical and meaningful stuff alongside some absolute amazing banter, which just makes you laugh out loud. Have you got any kind of, you know, when, when it comes to your experience of writing with different tones, is there anything that you've picked up that is particularly helpful for you when it comes to finding the right balance? Mm, I don't set out to write, you know, this will be a funny scene or this will be a serious scene or, or anything um it's just like life i mean life is a mixture of banter and seriousness and um tragedy and comedy and everything all at the same time and that's kind of how i try and write so um you know for instance like uh the movie aliens is sort of an action movie but it's got a bit of horror in it it's um but the banter between the marines is hilarious but you can see that that's what stitches them together to become an effective fighting force. So it's that kind of mixture I'm going for is that, that you have the light and the shade and people in dire situations make jokes. Um, and I don't, I don't ever want to sort of be seen as setting out to write comedy because that's not something I feel is my wheelhouse. So the humor in the books very much just comes from the interplay between the characters and, and it's their kind of, um, their banter that gives rise to the, the humor the same way as it does in real life. So. And that's a really good example because you think of a line like, you know, game over, man, game over. There's, there's something so human about that, isn't there? And the same thing could be said about all of the dialogue in your books. There's, it's so human. Um, even the spaceship feels human. It's amazing. Um, with regard to trying to find, again, I guess just on this point of balance, um, when you switch in between the characters, is that something that's intuitive for you? Um, I guess, yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, when I'm writing a conversation, off, off times when I'm writing a, a scene, I will write the dialogue first. And sort of in real time, as if they're talking back and forth. And I think that helps get the rhythm right. And then I will go back and put in the descriptions of sitting up, walking around, whatever they're doing, um, and fill that in later. And I think that that allows me to kind of switch between their voices, but also get a sense of the... Um, uh, what's it called? The momentum of the conversation into the scene so it doesn't feel like stilted or that there's long pauses or whatever so um from that point of view i just kind of it's a kind of a bit like acting i guess in that way where you think right okay i'm talking in this voice now now i'm going to talk in this voice and, and backwards and forwards and by using subtly different vocabularies for each character i think their voices come through because one will talk slightly, one won't use contractions, for instance, at a very simple level, or one won't use a swear word worse than heck. Or, and you, so you get these kind of, um, or one uses very, very Latin-based words, and the other's very Anglo-Saxon-based words. And you have this kind of, um, so it's easy to get these different voices onto the page. Yeah, that's that's a really, I really like the idea of writing sort of, you know, getting in the heads of the characters as you're writing them and flicking between them. It's a really, really good tip. And um, I guess 
the same must apply when it comes to like the bigger picture as well. When you're when you're writing a scene from a, a specific viewpoint, figuring out when to switch to the next character um, is that a similar kind of process? Is it just you know do you, do you kind of feel like it's the right time to switch, or have you got set parameters in mind that you know this chapter is going to do something and then I'm going to move on to the next one? I kind of, um, yeah, I don't have it set. I mean, obviously, sometimes you'll get several chapters in a row from the same point of view because that's how the action is playing out. So I don't kind of have a set thing. It's it's more down to the, how I feel the rhythm of the book and the way that's going at the moment. And I'll be like, oh, it's time we check back in with so-and-so. Um, so I'll switch back over and then, you know, or uh, in this particular scene, it would be, character a is finding this much more painful than character b so let's switch over to character a's point of view to get the full impact of it uh, for a while so it yeah it's more done on the fly like um you know deciding which instrument to to, to play at any one time in a in a tune or something yeah yeah it's really good letting some instruments have the lead in some sections and then throwing it over to somebody else kind of yeah. like space jazz more than space opera hmm yeah um with regard to this book i know that it differs to some of your other books in that you went through that awful experience of having written a lot of it and yeah. then losing what you'd written and i know that that's something you've talked about before but my take on it is that what you came up with in descendant machine was so fun to read and there was such a fun aspect to it how did you manage to make rewriting all of that come out as fun <laughs> as it did? Because if it was me, I'd have just been slogging through it and thinking, oh, this again. But you somehow managed to make it just sing. So how did you do it? it it's very hard work to make something easy to read. It, basically, it was just sweat and hard work. Um, but you know just having to try and, and make put that instill that sense of sort of excitement and fun and drive into something um and in order to do that basically the book as is now is very different to the one that i lost um it's got different characters similar kind of plot but the you know it went off in its own direction because i couldn't just simply rewrite i had to and i think to be honest, the book, the book has, as it's come out is a lot stronger than that original one was. It must be really nice to have that feeling. You know, if it had come out weaker, I can't imagine what it must have been like, you know, but for it to come out stronger, that's, that's brilliant, brilliant to hear. What was so important about this particular story that made you want to write it again and not just move on to something new? Uh, because I was contracted to write it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect answer. Love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there, it, I know, I know that obviously, you know, there will have been highs and lows, you know, having to go start from scratch must have been a, you know, a, a low. But was there, was there like a, a high, a particular high that you remember from writing it? Like a, a moment where you just thought, yeah, this is it. I've got it. The, the are moments where, you know, putting each sentence down feels like you know constructing a dry stone wall one stone at a time across a windy moorland and there are times when it just kind of takes off and flies and you look at the clock and think oh my god i forgot to have lunch and i've written four thousand words and, and those times you very much kind of get into a state of like hyper focus and it's very kind of um you feel very hyped and you finish writing you feel very hyped and yeah really and um th those are the good bits those are the reasons I still keep doing this yeah excellent yeah it's and i guess i guess you'll get that with every book and every project you know there will be moments like that right it's um it's not kind of like a one a one book that's it and then you're trying to search for that feeling again for the rest of your career that's yeah. yeah, and you know when you're reading a book and you're really enjoying it and it's really exciting, you think, oh, there's only 100 pages left to go. I'm going to stay up all night and finish it. Kind of like that when you're writing it as well. You think, oh, there's only about you know 
ah, there's only like two chapters left. I, I, it's midnight. I'm not going to bed. I have to finish this today. <laughs> and so you end up writing like 8,000 words in a day because you just can't leave it. So. Yeah. And then your self the next day is lethargically reading back through it and thinking, oh, how do I make this right? <laughs> it's, yeah, I've had that experience. It's, um, it's fun. It's, it's, but it's great to when you're in that zone and when you're in that, you know when you can almost like taste that it's it's there it's just there's nothing like it is that there's not that is why we do what we do right i i think hunter thompson likened it to riding a high and beautiful wave and it kind of feels like that yeah, yeah excellent and um, speaking of like a a high and beautiful wave that makes a perfect segue into what i next wanted to talk about which is um all of the success that you've enjoyed you know this book was nominated for the bsfa award and um, what stars and bones was and um, this book is getting loads and loads of brilliant reviews i've seen it it's just five stars across the board it's fantastic there's you know and that's that's not just these two books all of your books have garnered really good praise you've won multiple awards does that have a factor in what you choose to write next is there a pressure that comes from that or do you are you just constantly just trying to search for something new it's that old um quandary of right we want something brand new but that's just the same and you know the same only different and you know i've, I've done five hugely well received space opera novels with titan now and now is probably not the time to pivot to romance or westerns or you know so i'm i'm kind of i've kind of got there's a there's a, I think there's probably a perception out there now of what a gareth l powell book is and so i will probably be writing kind of in that wheelhouse um the book i'm writing at the moment is another space opera but i think it's very much a gareth l powell novel um now, within that, I wouldn't want to be like, you know, an actor says, I don't want to be typecast. So I will try and put new things in there. But inevitably, because I'm writing it, some of my kind of repeating concerns or themes or whatever will, will surface. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a case of trying to always trying to put a fresh spin on not the same formula, but a recognizable um story so that people who enjoy my stories will enjoy this new book um but also without me becoming stale so yeah that's really because i i kind of feel like a lot of people try and subvert things these days and it's all about subversion of what people expect but the best kind of subversion happens when you give somebody a little bit of what they're expecting and then you change it around and i guess it's a similar kind of thing you know you want to give your fans what they're expecting but you also want to make something new and fresh for them um are there are there any kind of authors that you look at and you think oh these have done it really well you know um that you kind of if you could take a, a leaf out of their playbook that would be perfect um Samuel Delaney often goes in in unexpected directions, and and obviously I mentioned M. John Harrison earlier. His uh, his uh, three book series of Light, um, Nova Swing, and Empty Space are uh, take a lot of the ingredients of, of various novels and then switch them around and play with them and change them and, and do unexpected things with them. And I think that's that's kind of what i tried to do with the the end of descendant machine without giving any spoilers i i kind of have the book leading very much up to something and then find a different way of doing it um which i think worked a lot better for the characters than than if i'd gone the obvious route and and uh, they had they had had to kind of go into the star wars mode of you know and uh, you know firing torpedoes down exhaust ports and whatever it it i think it worked a lot better the way that i, I managed to play out because the solution came from the characters and from their um imagination and resourcefulness so yeah and and i i kind of feel like that 
a subversion of what the audience is expecting. I think there's what's brilliant about Descendant Machine is that as a reader, you feel like it's going in a certain direction and then it does pivot and you do feel it, it is unexpected the way that it works out. And I kind of feel like it's so much more of a satisfying read for doing that rather than just following the formula. It's uh, it's fantastic. It's, uh, if there's an author that it reminded me of, you mentioned him earlier, Ian M. Banks kind of feel like the continuance series shares a lot of DNA with the culture series in that they're standalone sequels. And um, with, was that, is that a deliberate thing, you know, is in, in the, is he an influence of yours as a, as a writer, or is that just a really happy coincidence that it reminded me of this epic culture series? Um, no, it's not a coincidence. I really love the culture series. Um, you know, they're kind of my touchstone in the genre um i not trying to write like ian at all um i'm not trying to replicate that kind of thing at all and i think we have very very different writing styles um and anytime you write anything with sentient spaceships or giant spaceships you're going to be compared to him i mean it's 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 a given um but i mean he's you know i can't get away from the fact he's definitely an, an influence and when um my editor at Titan, uh, Kath Trekman, and I were planning this new series, um, the two books, Stars and Bones and Descendant Machine. She was very keen that it was like the culture books in that it would be um, standalone stories but set in the same universe, So, which gives them the benefit of being a series but also the benefit of being um, that the readers can just on board at any point and um reviewers can pick them up and review them without having to say oh this is the second third fourth book in a series so you can just pick one up and, and start there and it doesn't matter which way you go and i think that seems to be very um uh, very very much the thing in publishing at the moment they want to make it as easy as possible for readers to come into series at any point stark holborn um her hell's eight and ten low novels are the same they're both set in the same universe but are very much separate standalone stories so yeah i think it's a it's a very good strategy and it's fun because it meant i could set up this universe where i could tell different stories so stars and bones as i say is much more horror kind of john carpenter the thing meets battlestar galactica kind of um adventure whereas descendant machine is much more kind of core sci-fi space opera and then i can come back to that series in the future if i think of more stories that would work in it i can come back and, and kind of use it again and again and that's kind of what i was hoping to set up so um yeah hopefully if i think of a story that would work there i'll come back to it yeah i'm so glad you mentioned um stack holborn because a similar experience in reading stark's books for me was that loved the first one but the second one was just like pfft. and it's the same with with this stars and bones love it descendant machine just got me it was just amazing and um, you know when you compare that kind of series writing with some of the other stuff that you've written, because, you know, when you think about Akak Makak and you think about the Embers of War trilogy and you've got these big stories that are, you know, one book to the next, is it is it nice to be writing a series where you're not having to think about an overriding arc? Yeah, I mean, I, I've just before Styles and Bones, I'd just written two trilogies back to back and that's i mean that's fun but it it can also feel a bit confining sometimes by the time you get to the end of the third book you kind of you're a bit um institutionalized into that world and you just you, you want to break out and do something different so that's why after the the akak cat books which are sort of very much alternate world future thriller i i pivoted straight back to space opera which has always been my my first love and you know, because I just wanted to get away and do something completely different. Um, and yeah, I mean, the uh, also when you're writing a trilogy and you're like second, third book in, and you want to try something new, you you have some baggage and you have a story from the other two books and you have stood through lines from the other two books that you have to wrap up satisfactorily in the third. I mean, that was 
when I wrote Embers, the first book, it just flowed out of me. I had so much fun writing it. I don't even remember writing the second book because the experience was just the same. Just great fun. But then when I sat down to write the third book, the first book had just come out and was getting these amazing reviews. And suddenly it was like performance anxiety time in that, oh, damn people like this now i'm gonna to have to make this third book really something special and wrap up all the stories from the first two books and really stick the landing so suddenly i had the pressure of the first two books so yeah that's uh um to a lesser extent every time i write a book now i've got the you know you have to write a book that's as good as embers as good as stars and bones whatever um but then i always try to make every book i write better than the one before because you know, otherwise, what's the point? I, I, I never would, would like to be, um, like, I, I mean, I guess Lee Child. I mean, I, I'd love his book sales and his success and his millions of pounds. But I think if I was writing the same book over and over and over again, I, it, it would become drudgery. It would, it would lose the fun, it would lose the spark. Yeah, you don't want to be writing same book, new hook sort of syndrome, do you? You want to be doing something new which is really brilliant because it would be so easy for you to just slip into that okay i'm just going to rewrite embers you know um so the fact you are trying new things is, is just brilliant ties in with your process that you describe in about writing as well when you're talking about you know you approach it with all these different ideas and you just get ideas onto the page um have you found that the more that you've written the the more varied those ideas have become or the more streamlined they've become. Hmm, interesting. I mean, the more I read, the more ideas. Um, but yeah, I, no, I'm not, I'm not sure about that one. That's, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, it was something I was thinking about as I was reading about writing and I just thought, oh, cause I, the minute I'm at the very start of my writing journey, just ideas popping. But I know that sort of, you know, five, six books down the line, I'm probably going to be thinking, right, okay, I, I kind of know where I'm going with this. And I just wonder if it, if it will dry up, you know, <laughs> but it's, it doesn't seem to have done that with you. You just seem to be popping out ideas left, right and center, which is brilliant. Um, you mentioned something earlier that I just wanted to talk about, which is the idea of collaborating with an editor and collaborating with others. You've recently collaborated with a writer, which is Peter F. Hamilton with Light Chaser. Absolutely loved Light Chaser. It was it was so inventive in lots of different ways that I just and just really kind of book I absolutely adore. So I just wondered about whether being a traditionally published author is kind of trains you in a collaborative way in a way that being an indie author may not what's your experience with it um i'm not i'm not sure um i'm not sure about that so much i mean with working with an editor is very different from working with another writer um because with an editor they're going back through what you've written and, and suggesting ways to, to to sort of polish it up and make it stronger whereas working with another writer is working at the actual creation together and that's that's a very different experience i mean with peter it was it was a lot of fun and we we sat down and blocked out the story and then decided right which bits we were going to write and we played to our strength i mean peter did a lot of the the world building sections because there's a lot of chapters set on in different uh, societies on different worlds and he did a lot of that whereas i kind of played more towards the character side of it with the uh the light chaser on her starship and i wrote most of most of her scenes um and that was a lot of fun and, and it was kind of like that old party game where you you write a sentence and pass it to the next person and they write the next sentence and pass it back so it was kind of like that i'd write a chapter send it to, to peter he'd read it then write the next chapter and send it back to me and then i i got to read some new peter f hamilton work which no one else had read um and then write my response and we we played some games i, I put a cat an unexpected cat in one uh, chapter and then he killed it off in the next one and, uh, 
Uh, I will say it died of peacefully of old age after a good life, but that's the, through the effects of relativity. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun and it was very interesting. I mean, I'd, I'd done it before uh, years ago. I wrote a, a, a short story with Aliette de Bodard uh, for a uh, an anthology that was published by Solaris Books called Shine, um, and that that was a lot of fun as well. And it's kind of like. I guess two musicians jamming together, you sort of try and find um, a middle ground so your styles mesh, and I think that works quite well. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And I guess it's there's some there'll be some writers who, a little bit like with musicians, it's the perfect combination, and then others where it it's a lot of work to try and make it work. But it's so nice to find that when you've collaborated with people, it's you've kind of been jamming and enjoying it that's really nice have you learned as a writer um what what kind of lessons have you learned by writing with other writers um i found it makes you stick to your deadlines a lot more if you know that somebody's sat there waiting you know waiting for the next bit to pop through their inbox um so um but i mean writing with peter what it kind of showed me was that he was not afraid to just push the boat in terms of speculation and uh world building in and science in ways that you know i was my stories tend to be much more sort of character focused with everything uh, around the back in the background and i I thought oh i could i could take that and run with it a bit more i could i could have a bit more kind of fun broadening out the story and coming up with the um with the world and uh how that develops. So yeah, that was, that was an interesting experience. Yeah, that's really cool. It's, I I kind of feel like, um, hearing that and hearing that you're learning from Peter, I kind of feel like I also now just want to talk to Peter and find out what he's learned from working with you as well. Cause it's a, it's a mutually beneficial thing, isn't it? When you're writing with others. Um, Well, I hope so. (laughs) It, it, would you say that that's something a process that you would recommend to a newer writer or do you think it's important for you a newer writer to find their way of doing something before opening up to collaborating with others um, I mean different people work in different ways I think personally I think you have to find your own voice first before you can really share it um, and I remember for some reason it's stuck in my brain a, a, a quote by Larry Niven saying um nobody collaborates with a novice not even an, another novice um so I, I guess you know if you want if you want to write with somebody you want to write with somebody who knows what they're doing I guess so yeah so you've got to know what you're doing first yeah that's a great way of looking at it um, in terms of embers of war it's currently, as I understand it, being adapted into a TV series, which I really hope comes to fruition because I'm so excited about that. If you could choose a way for the continuance series to be adapted into another type of media, is there one that you would favour for it? I mean, obviously, I'd like those sweet Hollywood bucks, but um, <laughs> I th- I'm, I'm not sure how filmable it is. Um, I mean, Stars and Bones, I guess, is very classic horror, like the thing, and could be kind of very. But I mean, it's it would be very eff- a very effects heavy movie because there's you know the thousand arcs of the continuance, and they're all different, and they travel to so many different places. Um, so I guess from that point of view, it, it, I mean, it would make a lovely TV series, but it would be, um, you know, it would need a lot a lot of a lot of effects and a lot of kind of um and stuff and descendant machine as well is very reflective so i think they would have to be in places so there would have to be a lot of rewriting to because in a book a character can have an internal monologue and thought but when it's on the screen they you have to tell the audience so you have to have scenes where it's shown and so you it would probably need a bit of rewriting to do that that's something i learned with embers as well that things i could just knock off in a paragraph of description have to have a whole scene dedicated to them in order to get that across to the the viewer which is very interesting and educational 
experience for me reading the script because it was very much the uh, the distillation of that old uh, bit of advice of show don't tell um you have to show everything in the script and uh, so uh, for me i think reading that has helped me think about the way i write my novels as well but the thing with uh, space opera is i'm not really you know i'm not writing books that i think will be turned into movies like if i was writing like airport thrillers then you know i might be thinking but with, with space opera it's not you know it's not a huge um possibility that that will happen so i'm very fortunate that embers of war was picked up it's one of the reasons why i'm so excited about about it because when i think about space operas that have been made into tv shows you know that there, there aren't loads you know and i love space opera but it's like there's there's not really that many that you can look at and say oh yeah there's this massive long list of stuff that's being made and and so it will i'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing how they adapt it and how they make it fresh um it, as in through that process because you mentioned about you know learning things about novel writing from script writing is there something as well that you've you know a, the process of going to hollywood and meeting with these creatives and seeing how they're going to be adapting it it's is that helping as well with teaching you different things about you know this is this and that is that or it, is it is it very different to the world of novels it is very different it's very different indeed i mean the um in the book the the, the opening scene takes place um on the the upper part of a spaceship that's wallowing in a heavy sea um, and they're trying to rescue the crew of this crashed ship. And when the director came in and looked at the first draft of the script, he said, we are not building a water tank. So we're going to have to rewrite this scene. And it's it's the fact that those creative choices come down to budget and expense and hard work that makes you, you, you realize what a different medium TV is that, you know, you, you cut with a, a novel, you can just set it anywhere um and you, you know all you have to write is like the sun exploded but with tv you actually have to go and make the sun explode so it's um, yeah yeah that would be a great opening line but the sun exploded would be perfect the um the i think in terms of descendant machine the thing that is so brilliant about the the tone of it is that it does feel uh, very cinematic. So, you know, I kind of got to the end of the first chapter and Mafalda gets beheaded and full on before the next chapter could imagine the credits coming up. You know, that's, that's how it just got me in my, in my imagination. Do you think that, that, you know, that that's the magic of, of what books can do is that it can, it can kind of give you that experience, but from the page. Yeah, I think so. And I, I try and write all my scenes very clearly so that the reader always knows where everybody is and what everybody's doing and can kind of imagine the scene kind of, as you say, very cinematically. Um, and I sort of choreograph things so that um, it, it kind of makes sense and everybody knows what's happening. Um, at the same time, as you, you mentioned with that prologue, I've, I've done that with um, all, all five of the books I, I, I've had out from titan so far and that's something i learned from james bond movies is you can have a prologue that's like a teaser like a cold open where it's just you know something huge happens that's going to have an effect on the rest of the story but isn't necessarily chapter one if you see what i mean so in embers of war the whole story is is um kind of underpinned by this horrible event that happened three years ago in the war so i put the horrible event as the prologue so you see it and then chapter one is three years later and you and, and go on um and then so it's like i have an exciting prologue um then as you say the credits come up and then bang we're into the main story so it's very much like uh the, the james bond movie where roger moore is in a big ski chip pre credit ski chases skis off the cliff and then pulls that huge union jack parachute and that's kind of what I think of when I'm writing prologues. Yeah, the spy who loved me. That's amazing. Yeah. Is that is that your is Roger Moore your Bond, Gareth? Um, I don't know. I kind of have. I mean, he was the Bond I grew up going to the cinema to see. You know, when I was like 
10 years old, he was the man. Um, now looking back, it's all a bit camp and a bit, you know, so I kind of sort of prefer the kind of slight harder edge of Sean Connery, I guess, but I still got a, a soft spot for George Lazenby. Although that may mainly be because Diana Riggs in that movie. I don't know. So it's the it's the one that narratively is probably goes deepest into Bond. Um even the Daniel Craig era is is probably only matched on a Majesty's Secret Service in regard to, you know, what it what it narratively does um with relationships and everything. It's I, I I'm I'm the same as you in that Roger Moore was the one that I remember growing up watching on the TV as a kid. Um, he's the one with the most obvious stunt double, but he's, there's just something really classy, I think, about like his his Bond take. Um, but I guess that's kind of nice as well with regard to like the continuing series, is that your protagonist is fulfilling a certain role, but they don't have to be the same as one another for it to feel like it fits together. Um, yeah, do you do you think that? I mean, Bond is not sci-fi, but do you do you learn from other genres too? You know, are you taking things from like the thrillers and the the romances and? Yeah, I mean, everything you consume kind of goes into the melting pot at some point, and I do try and read outside of the sci-fi genre. Um, I think that's really important because you otherwise you know you have to make the main characters fully rounded human beings and not just sci-fi characters. So they have to have other stuff in their heads. So you have to know about culture and you have to know about romance. I mean, I'm not a big reader of romance, but you have to be aware of that. And thrillers can teach us a lot about pacing and plotting and, um, you know, military um, fiction can and non-fiction can teach us about battles and so on and what you actually see when you're in one which is actually very little of the bigger picture just the, the guy in front of you and so from yeah from that point of view i just try and read all over the place read as much as possible and i guess one of the things that i've learned from the most um in terms of storytelling is more like animated sci-fi and i know that you also are a fan of a certain series of animated sci-fi which is a, a love that we share of cowboy bebop yeah. um yeah, you may have, like, if anybody's tuning into this, you may have already picked up on some of those things with the ideas of space jazz and just talking about instrumentation all of the time. It's it's a, it's a great series. What What is it about that series in particular that, that made you a fan? Can you pinpoint the ingredient? Well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious from my, my fiction. A small group of slightly mismatched, squabbling characters on an old rattly starship that is totally my jam and that's you know it's uh that's what i enjoyed about firefly that's what i enjoyed about space sweepers that's what i enjoyed about the expanse um and so cowboy bebop as well and it, and it does the whole thing with a huge amount of style and, and fun as well so i mean it very much fits into that kind of that same genre that i write which i think comes from a love of the the old traveler rpg game in the 80s was just a small group on a ship doing stuff and it you know it goes back to han and chewy i guess um so yeah i mean it, it was very much i didn't see it for years and i only discovered it a few years ago and it was like oh, where have you been all my life so um i even enjoyed the the live action one although it was a very different beast um but it still had that that kind of found family dynamic thing going very well for it i kind of i remember um sort of it, i think we were having a little discussion on twitter about you know how great it would be for you to write something in the cowboy bebop universe and then when i read descendant machine the first thing that popped into my head is oh he did it but he just said it in his own universe <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, it, it's yeah if you're a fan of that you'll be a fan of this it's absolutely it's brilliant and um, with regard to your next books that you're writing uh, it's just been very recently announced that you're, you've got two new books coming out in 2025 through titan is there anything that you can share with us about what you're working on at the moment yeah well the uh, of the books the first one is a short story collection which uh, contains short stories set in uh, the embers of war universe and the continuance universe 
um, as well as like all the greatest hits from um, my, my last 20 years of my career. Um, I've had two previous short story collections out, but they were both from very small presses, and this will be my first kind of very widely available collection. So it'll it'll have some old stuff and, and, and plenty of new stuff and stuff that's never been collected before. I think uh, I think I sent um, I sent Kath about a hundred and ten thousand words of stories. So we'll we'll be sifting through those and, and getting the lineup just right. Um, so it'd be be sort of like a greatest hits collection in that that respect, I guess, with some new some new tracks um, to, for people to listen to. But uh, the second book is another novel. It's a space opera. It's set in an entirely new universe, and it's probably going to be a standalone. Um, and it's uh, called Future's Edge. Um, and uh, that's about all I can tell you about it at the moment, but I'm about a, thir- a third of the way through writing it at the moment. Love that title. Absolutely love it. Future's Edge. Really cool. And um, you're always so approachable on social media i you've always got great advice and willing to share and interact with different ones for anybody who is um new to discovering you as an author and doesn't know where to find you and um, can you let us know where they, where we can connect with you yeah I, well i mean um things are changing in social media sphere so quickly i mean if i say come and find me on twitter it might not be there tomorrow i mean we don't know <laughs> the way things are going right now um i am still on twitter although i'm mainly using it for announcements at the moment um at gareth l powell i'm also at gareth l powell on instagram which is a lot calmer and i get a chance to uh, talk more and post up pictures and i'm on substack uh, i have a substack newsletter which has like a free tier with a free monthly newsletter and then free announcements and then more in-depth writing advice and kind of personal updates for paid subscribers and there's about uh almost 1700 people signed up to that now so it's quite a quite a nice community of people i've got following me there um apart from that my website which is unsurprisingly uh, www.garethelpowell.com um and that's where you can find all the information about my books and, and so forth fantastic thank you so much for joining me today gareth and thank you so much for writing an epic um, book in, in Descendant Machine. If anybody hasn't read it yet, please go pick up a copy. You will not regret it. Um, but thank you for your time, Gareth. Thank you.